and gentlemen, can we uh, get ready for this final meeting tonight? I'd like to call the Tuesday, September 9, 2014 committee to hold meeting to order approximately 7.48 p.m. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Councilwoman Faircloth? Here. Councilman Williams? Here. Councilwoman Walden? Councilman Burgess? Here. Councilman Maldonado? Here. Vice Mayor Shelley? Here. Mayor Porter? Here. Any additions, deletions, deferral? Mayor, I think that you had uh, mentioned that you uh, wanted to uh, uh, move up tab 11 and 12. Well, yeah, those are just two eminent domain questions. I'll take, if there's no objection from council, move items uh, 12 and 13 forward. Uh, eminent domain question, is it 12 and 13? And tab two is removed. And tab two is removed, correct. They're Question. delayed. Okay. I, I just I just would have appreciated a phone call to let me know my item was going to be removed. You know, um, I'm very disappointed. Uh, nobody called me and tell me that it was going to be removed. I requested it. Uh, so I don't know for what purpose. I never got a call or email other than that it was updated that the item was removed. Item two, tab two. Uh, the clerk's office had sent, <laughs> sent something out to everybody, right? No, they sent what it was removed. They didn't, yeah. but I, as a sponsor of it, and and didn't get a call to say why it was removed. So I'm just saying, going forward, uh, in a diplomatic way, I would just appreciate it if I would be notified sure. and why. It was removed. Okay, no problem. I'm, I'm not sure. My apologies. So why <laughs> was it removed? I think that. Sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I'm waiting on the why was it. Removed? Uh, I think there was concern that uh, they want the education advisory board wanted to have some discussion, and so uh, that's uh, that was the reason to hold off since they're meeting on Thursday. Okay. Well, I just appreciate next time that I'm told instead of showing up and knowing that it's off to, because I had some stuff to talk about. Okay, hey, Mr. Attorney. Yes, Mr. Mayor. If, if I could briefly, just before we get started, um, uh, so, so that I don't miss it on the back end, um, I need to request an executive session uh, in the uh, pending litigation, William Ray v. City of Homestead in the Circuit Court of the 11th Judicial Circuit uh, for Miami-Dade County, case number 14 Zero one three one two zero CA zero six. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll go to tab t twelve if uh, eleven. T I'm sorry, tab eleven and twelve. Uh, if there's no objection, Mr. Attorney. Yes. Uh, tab eleven and twelve deal with uh, eminent domain settlement. Uh, at this term, at this time, I'll uh, turn it over to my colleague Pete Waldman to uh, address the council. Mayor, council members, um, these items have to do with two settlements pursuant to the Southwest 328th Street road widening project. Um, the first item was a settlement for parcel 25 of the project. Um, the settlement um, that was reached involved, in terms of the landowner, involved the same amount of money that we deposited pursuant to the order of taking for the property. There was also a settlement with the tenant, um, which was less than what the tenant was seeking. Um, we also settled all of the fees and costs pursuant to this settlement. And it, it's estimated that as a result of this settlement, it saved the city approximately potentially fifty or sixty thousand dollars in additional fees and costs. Um, which the city would have been responsible for paying had 7-Eleven, the tenant, and the property owner had gone to what was, what is referred to as an apportionment trial, because pursuant to Florida statutes, as part of full compensation, the city is responsible for paying for all fees and costs. Did I go, any, 
you want to go ahead and do tab 12? Yes, sir. Um, tab 12 um, was a settlement of parcel 16 of the Southwest 328th Street project. Um, we settled that within the range of the adjusted sales that our appraiser um, had in the report. The sales needed to be adjusted for time um, from the time that the appraisal was done. Um, the, the settlement was, for land value was $14.45 a square foot. The range, the adjusted range of the land sales was between $7.23 a square foot at the low end and $17.90 a square foot at the high end. Um, we also settled the attorney's fees and costs, which were nominal. Um, it is estimated that this settlement saved the city approximately fifteen to twenty thousand dollars in fees and costs, and that's based on if we had to continue to litigate this property, that's what the additional fees and costs are estimated to have been or would have been. Any questions from council on tab eleven and tab twelve? Ms. Waldman? I am all for this, it's wonderful, but if if later on if you, if you just let me know what parcel where these parcels are located, if there's a map or um, I can do that right now. Um, parcel 25 is the 711, which is at the northwest corner of, of Dixie, US 1, and Southwest 328th okay. Street. Um, and parcel 16 is a strip of land on uh, along the, um, the villages of Homestead Homeowners Association. So, and which parcel was that? 16. 16. Okay, and that one was for how much? The that was for ninety six thousand three hundred and two dollars, which included land improvements with the area to take, and a minor cost to cure, which involved putting some fill in to harmonize that property with the road that was being built, so that there wouldn't be a great difference. So, how much did you actually pay the homeowners association? Um, Pursuant to this settlement, the settlement is contingent on approval by council. Right. It will be $96,302. Right. And how big is that parcel again? That and parcel is 6,104 square feet. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, I missed the address. Could you give it one more time, the location for parcel 16? Parcel 16 um, is... I actually have an aerial, but it's approximately 162nd Avenue. I mean, if you would like, I can approach. I have an aerial of, the, of exactly where the parcel is located. But it's on the north side of the um, villages of Homestead okay. Homeowners Association. Ms. Wilman, did you say, what did you say? No, Mayor, Mr. Molino, I'm yeah. not trying to interrupt you. I just, I'm... If you, you you just said it's on the north side, north can't side be. Of villages. It is not north of the not north of, of 328. Of, no, yeah. it's it's south of 328. Actually. I meant north of of the development. It's, on the north it's side between Hummingbird and uh, 150. What's Tennessee? 157. Okay. 167. So it's that kind of area 167. Flooded. So it's between Hummingbird and. 167. Now do you know what I'm talking about? Where it's flooded, yeah. Where that big berm is. Yep. Okay. And, and does it go all the way? I'm sorry. Sure. It's my district, so I'm asking these Yeah, questions. no, no, it's fine. I just want to Does it go all the way to the berm where the where the, the, the hills are? Do you know? I can't I can answer that. It it basically goes to uh, where the existing light posts are. That's the edge. Right That's there. the edge. That's the edge. Okay. Thanks. Those posts are gonna remain in place. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions? Mr. Yes, um, now this is my district. The 7-Eleven, <laughs> um, the, on the Lucy Street, how much, how much of that property are you saying? Because that's... Well, from the 7-Eleven, we were only taking a permanent utility easement, but pursuant to that easement, it gives the city um, the right to go in um, and what was done is a utility pole was moved into mm -hmm the easement that was acquired. We also have the right pursuant to the permanent easement to go in, maintain the pole, to cut vegetation, um, 
also we needed to remove or potentially would need to remove some landscaping from that easement. And how much was that? Um, we paid the property owner for the permanent, it's a permanent easement, it's not temporary, $30,500. Oh, okay. And there was a small um, a settlement for $15,000 with the tenant 7-Eleven um, based on a reduction in its the size and quality of its leasehold for the property. Right, right. And that's one of the leases we just approved. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? If not, is there a motion for tab 11 and tab 12? Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. We'll go back to tab one. Thank Mr. You. Manager. Mayor, I have a, a conflict. I need to uh, excuse myself. I have a, a formal relationship with um, a Wayne Rosen, and um, so I've already filled out my form, and uh, I'm going to leave the meeting now, so I cannot take part in this uh, discussion. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Attorney, Mr. Manager, tab one. Well, tab one um, is um, an item uh, dealing with um, m &H Homestead, who is um, seeking an impact fee credit uh, from uh, the city related to uh, previously dedicated lands used uh, for parks and recreation. Um, and at this juncture, um, staff is looking uh, for a recommendation from the mayor and council with regards to the valuation uh, of that previously dedicated uh, land. Um, in your backup agenda materials, uh, there is uh, uh, a brief background information. Uh, there is also a memorandum, and in that memo, uh, there are four options uh, for the council uh, to consider uh, with respect to uh, the valuation. Um, and those are outlined uh, in, the, um, in the memo under B. Uh, 2B, um, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Um, I can uh, take any questions if you have any specific questions, try to answer those for you. Also, I know that um, m and Homestead is here this evening um, and uh, is prepared to answer any questions that you may have as well. Does the council have any questions for city staff at this point? No? Okay. Um, why don't we get the applicant up to the uh, microphone and state your name and address for the record, please. Good evening. Graham Penn, Burke Howard, Don Fernandez, 200 South Biscayne Boulevard. We have a, I've got a short presentation if the council desires it, but if not, can just open ourselves up for any questions that you might have. Presentation would be great. Sure. What should I do with this? Can I close this? Am I right? Sorry, guys. No, no, no. I'm just going to. I just need to put this down so I can read. I don't have anything as elaborate as as the manager has. So I'm just going to be very basic. Uh, again, Graham Penn here representing the successor developer, uh, the Villages of Homestead DRI, which is m &H Homestead. Um, Mr. Wayne Rosen, principal of the company, is here as well. The staff has laid out in its memo, and we also have, of course, the voluminous uh, letters and backup that we've provided to the city previously, which I'm obviously not going to repeat. Um, this is actually a very straightforward item. Um, and I'm going to try to be as brief as I can. This council needs to confirm the value of certain park donations made by the villages of Homestead in order to establish the amount of credit that the DRI is owed against park impact fees. The history of the DRI, again, is super long, um, and I'm not going to bore you with the irrelevant details. The project was first approved back in 1975 decades prior to the introduction of impact fees as a concept to the city. The first important thing to keep in mind when you're looking at this issue uh, is the DRI has, since its inception, a 
donated three large park areas to the city. You've got Audubon, which is at 23 and change acres. You've got the, the former Humpty Dumpty, which is now Roscoe Warren Park, at 27 and a half acres. And then you've got the Big Daddy, which is the Homestead's Forks Complex, which staff has assigned 138 acres to. It's actually a larger tract, but that's probably the usable land. These land donations, to give you a kind of a, a little bit of context, are about more than half of the total park acreage in the entire city. Um, so it's a gigantic amount of land that has been donated by this DRI over time. The city has now determined um, it's appropriate to charge impact fees, park impact fees to this to development within the DRI. For a long time that wasn't done. So now the question is if, DR, if impact fees are going to be charged against the DRI, what credit should be provided to those donations. Um, and what we've pro provided, and is one of the options that's before you and that's in our letters, is we think that the simplest way of dealing with this is to look at how the city has valued these properties in enacting the current impact fee ordinance. Uh, 2005 is the last time that the city modified its impact fee regulations uh, for parks. Um, that, that Resolution back in 2005 was based on a study provide, uh, uh, prepared by Dr. James Nicholas of the University of Florida, who is pretty much the, the leader in, in the state in impact fees. Um, he was also one of my professors in law school. He's a good guy, but he's, he's actually the expert in the, in, the, in the state on impact fees. And what Dr. Nicholas did was that he went through the supply of land he assigned each parcel a land value, and he assigned each parcel an improvement value, um, and then thereafter used that value to, to break it down by cap per capita, and then ultimately per square foot. So the rate that we have now that applies to every development that comes forward, every residential development that comes forward in the city is based on that analysis. And what our suggestion is, it's it makes sense, and you know, under the law, there is no bright line for calculating any of these things, for impact fees or for credits against impact, uh, against impact fees. Basically, the cases say you're, you have to be just and equitable in the way you've done it. So our position is that if we're charging everyone in the city based on a certain number, the value of this land, the person who provided the city that land should be credited with the exact same amount of, uh, that we're charging each development that comes in. So that's why we think it's a simple, straightforward, just and equitable way of dealing with the, the valuation issue is to assign the value to this property, these three parks that the city has already assigned to them in its impact fee analysis. So that's really the basics. Um, I'm here for any questions you may have. Um, we've tried to boil down, again, 40 years worth of history here uh, into something that's easily dealt with. Um, so we would ask that you recommend tonight that the, the calculation of the credits for the villages of Homestead be based on the impact fee analysis prepared in, in 2005. Thank you. Uh, questions from council? Vice Mayor? Uh, okay, I'll start. A quick question uh, from staff. What, what are you looking for from the council tonight? This is a discussion item. So do you need us to pick one of these items? Do you need to direction as far as whether we think? What are you looking for from us? Staff is seeking this evening is basically um, direction to utilize one of those options for valuation so that staff can complete the uh, impact fee uh, credit analysis um, and um, apportion it appropriately across the, the, the um, to the remaining units in the DRI. So just to value, just uh, a discussion or some direction to the city manager with respect to um, the appropriate valuation to be assigned to the uh, previously dedicated acreage. Okay, and I guess I'll, I'll, I'll weigh in on my opinion. I mean, this, I've had a lot of conversations with, with both sides and the attorneys and try to sort this thing out because it it's simple but complex all in the same time. And 
you know, the way I look at this is that I, I don't really agree with really anything that's been set forth as our options. I don't, I don't like really all, any, of, any of the four because I don't necessarily agree with valuating it at the 2005 levels because, again, that was the peak of the market. So you're talking about using land values. And I know I've had the conversation with, with the attorneys on the other side as far as why that was chosen, the logical connection. It's just I don't, I can't, I can't buy into that because I believe that the valuation should be determined at the time of the actual uh, gift to the city or when it was dedicated to the city, I think is the appropriate valuation time. However, I also believe that the impact fees that are being requested, you know, sh it should be kind of a wash because I believe if you're going to apply the valuation at the time of the donation or the dedication, then you should also apply the law that was in place at the time of that dedication, which at the time there was no impact fee uh, it wasn't even envisioned. No one even thought about impact fees as a, as a revenue producer for cities at the time. So at the time, the DRI said, okay, designated certain lands that the developer had to then donate or dedicate, which he did. And so the way I look at it is, is that in that respect, it's a wash. Now, I know that there may need to be evaluation for legal purposes. I, I'll let the attorney sort that out. But for my purposes, the land was donated in what was essentially an impact fee regulation at the time, although in a completely different form. So that's kind of how I view this because I couldn't support the, the recommendation and that is value it at 2005 levels and then you have this large credit that's being kind of calculated that's owed and due. I don't agree with that, but I do agree that the impact fees or, or what would have been impact fees have already been settled and essentially washed out at this point. So that's kind of my position is that the developer shouldn't be paying additional impact fees. There shouldn't be a double dip that goes on here. Um, now, how we effectuate that, I, I don't know, but that's that's kind of my position, and then I'll wait and see where the, my colleagues weigh in on. I mean, to muddy the waters even more than they already necessarily were, but, um, but that, that's kind of my position. Mr. Vice Mayor, I, I would just add from our point of view that obviously we have no issue with going in that direction either. I mean, it's basically gets you to the same result, which is a recognition that, you know, all, all of this acreage has been provided, and the DRI provided it uh, as a mechanism at the time, in, you know, to, to relieve itself of, I mean, to to deal with the the impact that it, that it was providing. So that is a that if that is a solution that we're amenable to as well. Okay, and I reached that just because of a for fairness pact. I mean, when I, when I saw the facts and I'd ask all these questions and talk to the attorneys, it just it, it seemed fair that at the time that you know the developer. Was, was complying with whatever the law was, was dedicating that land um, with no intention that there would ever be any creation of impact fees. And then now to have an impact fee and say, well, doesn't, you know, the, the square peg doesn't fit in a round hole, how do we solve the problem? And that, that's just kind of the way I, it's worked out in my head. Anyone else? Well, Ms. Waldman? Well, I mean, this, this is very complicated. All of it is very, very complicated. Um, You know, I don't know what the rules were back when the land was originally uh, dedicated, but I do know that the amount of the land, the size of the land is huge, and we would never have um, the Roscoe Warren Park. We would never have the Audubon Park. We would never have um, what is known as slash, 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 you know, Homestead Sports or now the Temporary Police Quarters or the Keysgate Charter School. You know, there's just so much there. And I, I, I just feel in my heart, I mean, I've tried to listen, I've tried to read, I've tried to learn. <coughs> but in 2005, isn't that what, <coughs> excuse me, isn't that what we now uh, base our impact fee structure on? So, and yes, 2005, I mean, I'm a realtor, so I kind of know when I started really selling a bunch of houses, um, it was just the, and the height, uh, it was just the beginning of the market. I mean, in 2004, it was terrible. So 2005, we were starting to, to pick up. So in my opinion, I mean, I think that that's, I'm okay with it. Because we would never have all that. And I remember when, I mean, I live in the villages of Homestead. <coughs> I live um, in my house. I've lived in my house for 28 years. So that was the first start of, of, of Keysgate. We separated from the Master Homeowners Association 
But, you know, the Keysgate area brought life after Hurricane Andrew that we didn't have. So, um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it. I don't. I'm, I don't know what what's really expected of us tonight on this dais. I'm a little confused, but um, and I agree a lot with what um, Mr. Shelley said as well. But I I, I just don't know. I'm, I'll wait to hear what the rest of my colleagues say. Mr. Maldonado. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Vice Mayor Shelley, thank you for your your complex way of thinking. I think it made it uh, <laughs> simple for us. Uh, I understand you. So. As a network engineer, sometimes the complex things to explain it, uh, we get to be lost. But at the end of the day, uh, this seems to be, you know, somewhat of a wash, and I would agree with that that statement. Um, looking at the parks that were dedicated at that time, we could see the significance that it is to the city of Homestead today. Uh, the Mayor Roscoe Warren Park, uh, one of the most attended and, and best parks, I would say, today in the city of Homestead. Um, and all our parks are great, not taking away from any of them. And uh, and look where we are today where, you know, for many years the stadium has been sitting there as, you know, kind of a vacant uh, a piece of property, what we would always call the pink, pink elephant. Or, and uh, But today it serves a, a great purpose and, uh, you know, alongside of a charter school that's sitting on its property um, that's educating our, our, our children here in the city and now a temporary facility um, that's uh, a holding pattern or holding place for a police station. I think it's it's worked out well, and I think uh, we, uh, Councilman Waldman and myself, and and kind of think alike in the sense of there's definitely a lot more potential for the park, and that's something that we need to look at it uh, for the future. So the value that we're getting uh, for this property, and, and not only, and obviously the Autobahn Park, of of course, you know, for the community. Um, but looking at all the, the parks and, and the land dedicated, I think that it's a significant part uh, for here in the city, so I would be okay and um, you know, agreeing if that's going to be the methodology that we use with the 2005 agreement. If that's what we're using today, then, then I would agree uh, to work with that. Thank you. Ms. Fairclough, you got anything? Ms. Fairclough? Thank you, Mayor. Just very um, briefly, uh, there's no doubt about it. Our city has, in fact, benefited from the donation of these properties. And in 1975, I know impact fees weren't even thought of. So when you try to sift through this complicated decision, you ask, okay, what is the frame of reference? If we're to add a value or to quantify what the properties are worth, then what is the frame of reference? Well, 2005, it appears, is a frame of reference because that is the inception of the whole impact fee ordinance. So as difficult as it is, I would feel comfortable with using the 2005 as a frame of reference or barometer to kind of quantify the value for these assessed properties. So I'm in favor, although it may not be pretty, but the 2005 frame of reference. Ms. Wollman. Thank you. I forgot to, to mention one thing, and that is that the <clears throat> Humpty Dumpty property, which is what it was known for because it was nothing but a dump, you know, we didn't even start to utilize that property until 2009 when the, when the park was open. And I think that's a very important factor to add. You know, I mean, the, the, the um, land just sat dormant until we could get it cleaned up through Durham. And we went through, and as Julio will tell you, and Dennis, I mean, we went through hoops. To, uh, to accomplish that. So I'd like to go ahead and make a motion that we accept the, um, the fee of um, the impact fee study of 2005 and base it on the 2.17 square foot. There's a motion. I believe is there, that's what the map is. There is there a second? <coughs> yeah, you're, well, uh, if I could, oh, you're, I don't you're, want not, to you're not taking official action oh, okay. uh, as a cow. Um, we're just looking, looking for, for direction. For uh, general consensus direction from the, the council, majority of.
Thank you, Mayor. Hello. Okay. Uh, to the attorney or to the, to the manager, this decision here tonight only is, affects M&H within the city, or are there other parties that come back and come to us with questions or do things also? It, it would, this particular impact fee request um, only affects properties within the DRI, and so it only affects the remaining residential units in the DRI. Um, if someone were located outside of the DRI um, and they wanted to file a request, uh, your code allows for them to do so. They would come in, they would file a request with the city manager, uh, and they would need to present evidence uh, as to they previously dedicated uh, either land or made a monetary contribution to the city, uh, and as such, uh, seek a credit uh, against the, ap the implication or the application of, of impact fees. And, and do we know if there's anybody else out there to come to us uh, looking for to do that? I can't answer that question for the rest of the city uh, because every day you have applications that come in for residential developments. Right. But with regards to the DRI and all the properties in the DRI, this would cover um, anyone in the DRI who happens to um, own property that could be developed, ha have has residential rights to develop. So it would include m &H Homestead. It would include other property owners in the 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 uh, DRI. So whatever value is assigned this evening, that value will then be calculated based on the the total number of units and allocated across the board. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Well, so in, in essence, there's 3,158 units available in the DRI left. Based on that calculation of nine, roughly $19,608,000 of credit on the books, in essence, those 3,000 units would have no impact fee charged on them at all. Correct. It, it would, uh, this would, uh, would, would apply uh, to the application of any future impact fees. Um, that number, I think roughly we did some, ma some math. It just depends on the, t the, everything's based on square footage. So you don't know whether something's gonna be 1,800 square feet, whether something's gonna be 1,600 square feet, or whether something's gonna be 2,000 square feet. But if you just assume 2,000 square feet is the, um, the average for for all the residential units to be built, um, the remaining fees, um, impact fees for uh, parks and recs for, based on 2,000 square feet, would yield a total of um, 13 million 705. Right. Now, the, the difference between the 13 and the 19, are we gonna owe them a check at the end of the? No. No, the credit would just um, the drawdown. Right. So anything over and above that would not be a refund or a check that would be cut to M&H Homestead or to anybody in the DRI. It would just serve as the credit as far as it would go. Okay. I, you know, I had an opportunity to speak with someone that is developing out there, and I was astounded with the impact fee in general, just in general. Um, I know that the settlement agreement, you know, there was some things that sunsetted and settlement agreement kicked in and then the impact fee went from a dollar figure to like 10 times, 15 times what, you know, what the, what the value initially, what we were originally charging. It, is, the, is the number skewed that we're charging at this, at this, because what we're doing in essence is we're giving the DRI competitive edge in the marketplace because all the other developers are going to want to knock on the door now to get in the same competitive position. But if we, if the analysis that I went made aware of, the the impact fee was on some of these residential units. But does that make sense or not? It does, Mayor. And I, and I think the, without getting super complicated, I can I can just say that yes, you're correct in that the numbers jumped exponentially, and that is because. Um, 
prior to um, middle of 2011, um, there was an agreement in place uh, with respect to um, all the residential development in the DRI and the impact fees uh, were capped at, off the top of my head, I, I can't remember, but somewhere in the, in the field of like 250 to $275. Um, and that agreement, um, whatever date you, you want to look at, but we're using the middle of 2011, it basically sunset. And at that juncture and that moment in time, everything in the DRI then became um, subject to the city's uh, impact fees that were on the books. And so when you, when, you know, going from 275 to now applying the impact fees under the methodology that you currently have established, uh, depending on that square footage, you're looking at several thousand dollars jump. And in some cases, you know, per unit, the impact fees range anywhere from four to six to eight thousand, depending on the size of the unit. So th that's that's the cause of the huge jump in the impact fee. The current methodology that you've adopted and you've accepted um, is two dollars and seventeen cents which is the high range of what you could charge. Uh, but certainly um, within that frame, um, the city has the ability, you all have the ability to do something much lower than that. Well, the example that you brought up is exactly the, the, the example that I'm talking about because inside the DRI, these 3,100 and some odd units have no impact fee. Outside the DRI, the new developments that come in, they could have $7,000 impact fee compared to zero impact fee. And I under, this, these are tough questions you just have to be asked, you know, because it, we're trying to figure out the best thing to do. And, and so there is an extremely um, big differential, if you want to call it, between zero impact fee for parks and, you know, an $8,000 impact fee for the, a similar structure outside the DRI. So I just, you know, we open up the floodgates for uh, waiving of uh, or, or exceptions to impact fees or we take a look at our impact fee structure and see if it, you know if it's a if it's a fair and amicable kind of a, a kind of a fee structure because I was floored uh, to, to find out the numbers so uh, and you can and certainly direct your staff to to revisit and look at the methodology but with regards to opening the floodgates and with regards to um, anyone uh, wanting to make the same claim or fall under the same um, impact fee credit uh, analysis that's uh, currently before you, I think it's a little bit different structure because you're dealing with a closed class and that closed class is the DRI and the previous land dedications that were done within that DRI. And so I don't think, um, never say never, but as far as our analysis has uh, led us to in discussions with staff and discussions with m and Homestead, um, I don't think anyone similarly situated in the city uh, that would be able to, um, they might be able to make a similar impact fee credit argument and based on some other previous land dedication that might warrant a credit similar to what's being applied for now, but it would not open the same type of argument for someone wanting to use this land dedication for something outside the DRI. I know, Vice Mayor, you were acting like you wanted to say something. Mr. Burgess, did you? I'll say something. Ms. Wallman? Yes. You have things. My light's attached to a water bottle. Does that tell you anything? <laughs> um, I mean, with no disrespect, and again, the, the questions all have to be asked, you know. Um, but I think we're comparing two different things here because we're talking about a development that was, you know, structured many, many, many years ago, and the land was donated many, many, many years ago. Um, I think, I mean, I was sitting here trying to remember and trying to think if there were even, if there's even anybody else who could even have that argument where they, do, they donated land before. Um, I do agree that we are on the high end of the impact fees, but then again, that's another discussion. That's a discussion if we want to start, if we want to lower some of the impact fees and, and, and do that in order to, 
attract more people <coughs> to come to Homestead and build. But this, to me, is a different, and it's just my opinion, but to me, this is a different situation. This is a, an established development who donated these acres of land. We didn't even use the Roscoe Warren Park, and I don't have, I know, what is it, 19 acres in the Audubon, and was that 187 at the sports stadium? And I can't remember how many acres there were at uh, Rusco Warren Park. But, but to me, it's different. Now, maybe I'm interpreting it wrong. I don't know. But to me, it's different. And, um, and, and that's, a, that's a whole other discussion about the, whether we want to, for fu uh, future endeavors, to lower the impact fee, and, and again, it is high. It is really, it's high for somebody coming in. I mean, I'm sure they're shocked when they see the number. But I don't know how it compares to other cities either. You know, we might be right in line. So, you know, I think we need to separate or decide, is it all the same or is this a separate issue? It's a separate issue. It's a separate issue. I brought it up as a competitive question because this is going to definitely give an advantage to the DRI, which it, you know, obviously it, it maybe should have an advantage, but it's it's kind of a um, it's a huge differential when you look at it from the options that were given. Option two is an impact fee credit of seven hundred and fifty-six thousand dollars based on when the city purchased it which is in the 89, 1989 range, and compared to the evaluation in 2005, which is 19,608,000. So it's just a huge number differential that I'm trying to get, you know, again, these are tough questions, but, you know, everybody in the room has been working on this for six or seven months, and we got it Friday afternoon, or I got it Monday morning when I got back from being out of town. So it's a huge hill for me to have to climb and there's no definitive, um, real definitive answers in my mind. But um, you know, the, the, the will of the council, we got to give, we got to give the manager direction, or we'll be here all night. But uh, Vice Mayor, did you have anything to follow up? No, I don't really have any follow up. I'm just more curious about the process and where we're going, because there were some questions that were asked, and and so for me, you know, I have, I express my opinion. And so depending on if there's a motion made and we have to vote on something, there's a chance that I would end up voting against that motion, although I supported the spirit of of the effort and the spirit of what's going on. So that's, I just want to see where we're going with this. If I can, meet. Mayor. Let's get a motion to extend the meeting now uh, for an hour, and hopefully we'll do it quicker. An hour, is there a motion to extend for an hour? I'll move. Is there a second? All in favor? Aye. Uh, Judy was a second, Patty. I'm oh, sorry, Mr. Manager. Mayor, my understanding when we first started this process is, in general, this kind of a determination is administrative with there's a clarity in the law. When we really couldn't get anybody to give us clarity, that's when we decided maybe there's a policy issue here, get some direction. But at this point, James, if you have a consensus on the formula, do you really need anything official from them beyond consensus? And, and is this not then at this point just an administrative sign off? Right. Okay, so basically if you're all comfortable with the 05 concept, or comfortable with the concept of they gave the land and therefore they don't owe anything more, then in essence what we'll do is we'll just process the, uh, the credit so that uh, anticipating no uh, 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 fees and then also to process a refund on the escrow for the couple of uh, permits that we issued for uh, Patrick, correct? Kelly Greens. Kelly Greens, right. So. Assuming you're comfortable that there's no, nothing more that they owe, then we're pretty much done. But we need just general consensus if that's the direction. Is there any, oppos is there any opposition to get, letting them go forward with the manager's statement? Go and predicate it on the 05. I, mean, I don't agree with the 05. You got one no. Well, yeah, that's the thing. I, I don't agree with the 05 use, but I agree with not having them have to pay fees based on them giving the land, and therefore I think they've already satisfied any requirement to give any funds. What about evaluation closer to the 2,000 square feet at 3,156 units? That's a $13 million number. I'm just throwing things out because I don't, you know, we've got to get somewhere. So if I could suggest that if at least a majority of you feel that at this point they don't, they shouldn't have to pay any additional fees 
in my opinion, the easiest thing for us so we don't have to hire any more appraisers and whatever is they gave a large block of land. And that was what they were asked to do at the time to mitigate the development and deal with uh, uh, parks. And they've given that, and therefore we shouldn't be charging them anything else. And then, James, I'm assuming that means we're done, I'm assuming they're comfortable with that methodology. Process it in. So I just need to make sure if you're comfortable with that approach, then we don't have to hire any more appraisers. We don't have to do a whole lot more analysis, and we're pretty much good to go. Ms. Walden. Yes, I, I'm in agreement to that. But I did want to tell you that I did misquote on the acreage amount. It was 23.42 um, acres for Audubon, 138.20 for the baseball stadium, and Roscoe Warren, 27.52 just wanted for the record to clear that up because I think I said more. Um, but I'm, I'm good with that and I'm good with Callie Green as well. Okay. Does that 138 acres include the lake or is that all dry land? It doesn't include the lake. does not. That, that lake is extra. Uh, anyone that wants to oppose them settling this agreement with no more impact fees? So in essence, go for it. Okay. Thank you. Tab two has been pulled. Tab three. <coughs> uh, Mayor, this Tab one here, we have, even though we prepared for one presenter, we thought out of fairness there should be two presenters if you're comfortable because you'd asked us to come back with how can we make sure that as the projects move forward, we can maximize the chances of local people participating in the work that's being performed. And so we have the first group that will come and they'll give a presentation. And then the second group, which we've talked about, they have a slightly different concept or an add-on concept. And then we'd like to ask for some direction on where you want to go from here. Okay, go right ahead, Mr. Manager. to a certain time frame. How long do you think your presentation will be? Quickly. we got a long agenda. So as quickly as you can, please. Can you do five minutes five, a piece? Five, okay. five minutes I, a piece. I, I, and, and, and my colleague just referenced that you've been sitting here for so many hours. I don't mean to be disrespectful at all. Uh, okay. I, I just want to say that. <laughs> Sorry. Wait, through the mayor, should we let Councilman Williams know that we're proceeding? Oh, yeah. Is he still here? There he is, there he is. Okay. <laughs> <It's> easy. <laughs> mayor, the first uh, group is Career South Source, South Florida. Let me go ahead and start while. Go right ahead, sir. I know your, your IT folks have been here working very diligently. Uh, my name is Rick Beasley. I'm the executive director of Career Source South Florida. Do me a favor and at least try to speak into that microphone. Okay, I was trying to not be in his way, but uh, my name is Rick Beasley. I'm the executive director of Career Source South Florida, uh, formerly known uh, as uh, South Florida Workforce. Uh, our legal name is the South Florida Workforce Investment Board. We've been around for over 30 years. I took over the agency about nine years ago. Uh, they recruited me from the state of Missouri. I used to be the state director for our governor there. Uh, there are some board members uh, that uh, you are very familiar with. Uh, one, uh, Mr. Willie Carpenter, who is your vice president with uh, uh, Community Bank here, also LT Clayton. Uh, and last but not least, we had uh, Maria Garza with Mexican American Council. Those are members of my board who are citizens and are very uh, diligent citizens here in, in, in Homestead. And ironically, I, I, I got the chance to see uh, Joe Cordina, who used to be a board member of ours. I think he stepped out uh, or he left, but he was a board member. I didn't know he was here. I didn't get a chance to really talk to him. But those are some of the leaders who, who actually are, who I report to. Uh, we're a $70 million operation. We're federally funded. Our role is really to work with municipalities as well as government and other entities to provide employment and training solutions throughout Dade and Monroe County. So I cover all the way down to the Keys. And unfortunately, someone has to cover the keys. I do, so don't don't hurt me for that, okay? Uh, but our role here is to provide assistance. We have an opportunity to meet with uh, uh, 
uh, one of your city councilwomen uh, to, to discuss uh, Councilwoman Forklaw about this item. But to work with your, um, uh, your city manager, and we want to thank the city manager for allowing us to, to meet with him, uh, to look at uh, an employment, a local employment training solution uh, to be able to address needs in your community, uh, to ensure that the citizens of your community maybe have the first opportunity to be considered for employment opportunities uh, of those contracts that you release. And our role here, we've done this for a number of workforce, a number of uh, entities across um, uh, the county. We are the largest workforce board in the South. We're actually the largest board in Florida. Uh, our funding, uh, and we're not asking for any resources, but our resources are here to provide a way. I can log in? Okay, good. I can log in to kind of demonstrate what we do. I know we have a, um, uh, a slide presentation, but I won't go, go through that. Um, what we had demonstrated for the, for the manager was to indicate to him how our, our agency uh, provides services. Uh, some of you all were probably at some of the dedications. I know um, um, when with the Mexican American Council, we awarded about $100,000 in scholarships uh, for the youth there to, uh, to be able to go off to college. We also have a career center, uh, which is located, we've moved it, but we located it on 100, um, I don't know it's US, US 1, I think it's 128.95 US, uh, US 1 on Dixie Highway. And so our agency provides employment and training services. We have about 14 career centers across uh, the county and Monroe County. I have about six different providers. So the entities that work inside the career centers aren't my staff, but they're ones that we have funded to provide employment and training solutions. And so if I can log on here at the same time as I'm talking. I'm typing too fast. There we go. All right. And one of the things that we do, we, we provide, again, uh, resources to help employers find workers. Uh, we incentivize employers either through on-the-job training where small employers, we can reimburse up to 90% 90, 90 of their uh, the training costs. And typically, the training costs is the wages. And so here is a way of, again, through this local hiring initiative is that any contracts that you uh, release out to uh, to any contractor, whether it's or build goods and services or, con or construction, uh, our role here really is to assist you to identify and help the citizens of your community to be able to find employment. That's our role. We're not asking for any resources, but as a way in that we show Mr. Manager of how we're able to identify individuals. And here, I'm able to look, and we're the only workforce board in the country. We, we've built these tools, and we have actually have them patented for us so that we're the only ones who can, actually can use it, and then we can sell them. Um, but I'm able to identify individuals here in the community. I know uh, for our region, I have well over 309,000 job seekers that have been listed. For the city of Homestead, I have a way of being able to do it either by city, zip code, or DTA, which is what we call an empowerment zone, enterprise zone, a target urban area, community development block grant area, or a commission district. And since we um, um, kind of work with a commission significantly, we're able to, um, uh, to identify for them uh, by uh, commission district. Here I'm going to pull up real quickly uh, the, for the city of Homestead, the number of folks that we have registered. You have about 60, 65,000 residents, right, uh, in the city. 7% of those residents have, or, I'm going to say 10% of those residents are registered in my system. 7,200 individuals are registered. The beauty of this tool is I'm able to drill this down. So let's say, say in, in instance for construction, I have well over 300 or 450 individuals residents of uh, Homestead who are registered in our system to look for employment. And I, and I failed to tell you that last year we placed over 63,000 individuals in jobs. I was able to generate $1.6 billion of salaries back into data in Monroe County. That's how detailed we get it. I, it spent me $811 per placement to get those individuals hired. Okay. This year our goal was um, a little higher. We're actually coming to our end of our fiscal year. 67,000 individuals have been placed in employment cost me $756 to get them employed. I generated $1.7 billion of salaries back into our community. So in terms of creating jobs, again, 67,000 jobs created. We served over 19,000 employers in Dade and Monroe County. And so those are some of the services that we do offer. But you actually can see here, in terms of the job seekers that we have in our system, how we're able to drill it down, and be able to identify those individuals. Here I'm going to pull up so you can see the types of occupations under construction and trade. The beauty of this, and I'm going to drill down even further, you can see if I'm looking for laborers, uh, construction laborers, I have, I have 107. 
And I actually can drill down to that to see who those individuals are. So I'm able to see that I have uh, Ms. Bonilla, Mr. Bonilla or Mr. Uh, Arliss. Those individuals, I'm looking online, I'm able to, I'm not online here, if I was registered on LinkedIn on my system, I'm able to hyperlink into their job bank to be able to refer them over to the job for those employers that are, or your contractors that you have. That's our system. Our role really is to work with your administration to be able to identify where there are key areas of your community who have issues of high unemployment, to be able to address those, to reduce crime. That's what we do. We're a board that provides investment into the community. And so when we terms about expending dollars, we don't consider it expenditures. We consider it an investment. And so those are the things that our, our board does. Again, some of the folks that were on our board I mentioned, again, Mr. Willie Carpenter, Ms. L.T. Clayton, um, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Garza, they direct me. We give uh, an allocation just like the manager reports to you, an allocation. We identify those, those areas that we want to fund, and this is one of the areas that we do fund local hiring initiatives. And we've done this for about four or five different municipalities as well as the county. So Mayor. short and sweet. Mayor, and if I can add, uh, in the conversations we have with them, as we're trying to figure out how to, we satisfy your goal of trying to encourage the uh, contractors to hire more local people, local subcontractors, what we think we can do with this organization, if this is one way you wanted to go, is for us to basically incorporate a paragraph into our contracts that say that if you're going to fill any positions for this job that you're doing for us, we require you to go to their website and at least look at the inventory that you have. Click yes, click no, so at least we know that you're doing this so that you can see what we have here. We be believe based on what we've seen already with MCM and Lunacon, just the voluntary uh, the jobs fair that they had, they're already starting to hire a bunch of people locally. This we think will help the contractors. And so we'll come back to you if this is one area, and you'll have a second presentation, but if this is one way you wanted to go, we can have a sample paragraph for you for the contracts, and also we would have some sort of an agreement with their organization so they can provide this service to us free of charge, and then also we're, we're in dialogue with them now. They may have some federal programs for us to have some uh, workers here through the year, internship programs that they call the Scholars Program. Right. And we're really excited about that as well. And so we've already discussed with them some of the needs we might have within the organization. And we're going to come back with a little more detail with that with them on that as well. Uh, the one thing we're very nervous about is if we go the direction of requiring X percentage of the people that they hire to have to be from Homestead, because we only got two proposals on the city hall, uh, $25 million, $25.5 million dollar project and so as we start bidding for additional projects we don't want to um, end up scaring away uh, the competitors because they feel that they're overburdened and in some cases you may have a, a local subcontractor that bids as part of the contractors bidding process so for example MCM before they went ahead and submitted their bid for 25 and a half million dollars they went and they shopped around with local subcontractors for the electrical and for the plumbing. Somebody that, that was the cheapest could have been from Hialeah, and they may be a local electric company, the uh, contractor that's had the same four people for the last 10 years. They're not going to abandon those people to go ahead and hire strangers from another place. So we don't really want to get involved with that element of this, but. We think we can pr pr we can show some fairly good results with this partnership, and they have committed to us that they'll be very flexible to meet our needs. Now, the second presenters have a, a, a significantly different approach to this, and we thought you should hear that as well. Vice Mayor, you had a question. Yeah, just a quick question. And that is, how how do you generate the applicants or the potential applicants for your database? How do you how do you Actually, reach out to them and have them sign up for your system so that when uh, these potential, these contractors or employers go and search your database, there's a large group of Homestead residents. Well, technically, we, we are, are part of the state. Uh, we are part of the uh, Employed Florida Network. Uh, nation, uh, statewide, we change our name to Career Source Florida, and we are one entity of 24 boards. We're Career Source South Florida. And so uh, we generated through outreach marketing uh, to be able to get folks to, to get registered. But technically, anyone who's lost their jobs, uh, are required to uh, to do to do uh, registration yeah, through Employed Florida. In the instance, I'm the state as well as local as well as the municipality. Oh, and Vice Mayor, I, Jerry just reminded me we had a conversation with them because as we were 
not to keep repeating myself, but as we did all those presentations, when we met with the Haitian community and other uh, portions of the city where they felt like we should be coming out to them and speaking to them in their, in their native language, they have agreed to have an outreach team. They'll go to designated communities that we asked them to go to. And that'll also be part of this. this, this so we'll have some right. uh, Creole right. speakers. We'll have some Spanish speakers. We'll have, and you'll help us okay. where, with the outreach, where you want us to go. And they're prepared to do that. And we'll have that in the agreement with them as well. Because the computer is one thing. And the other thing is it's understanding basic outreach, how the system, right. Right. Uh, we, we do this across the, the county. Uh, you know, Councilman Shelley, that our role here as a board really is to provide employment solutions for you. And we've done job banks or job wor uh, workshops uh, for a number of entities. Uh, we have three mobile units uh, that are satellite connected. So if you've asked me to be down here, we're here. Uh, matter of fact, well, our mobile unit's been located down here because uh, there's, I guess, some infrastructure items going on. I need to talk to you, Mr. Manager, about that. But the infrastructure is going on about uh, our location. But our mobile unit's there to provide services. But Mr. Manager is right that we've agreed to come out uh, into those locations and to be able to have hands-on uh, job fairs or even workshops to provide additional services. That's our role. Right. And that, that was my big question because, I, you know, it's one thing to have a passive database where people, right. you know, sign up, but I want to make sure that we have some sort of active effort by your group to go out there and actually get our residents involved and get them employed. So that's, I'm great to hear. Thank you for the supplement. Right. And that's one of the discussions that we did have with the manager and the staff about how we can do that. So our role, we made that commitment to do that. And the nice thing, too, is that your tax dollars are already paying for these. Right. They're, they're getting federal funds, so why not take advantage of the services that they offer? Tell you, my I'm at a delay. Yeah, they're trying to censor me tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I know what the problem is with this mic. Um, but uh, I'm glad to uh, finally meet you, um, and uh, I've tried to reach out to tried to reach out to you, but never was able to connect with you over the last five years since I've been elected in office. Um, and so I'm very appreciative for your uh, pontificating all of this great information for us. My question is: Are you saying that we're going to uh, perhaps? Um, have a contract with this particular organization. Uh, We're going to have some sort of a uh, uh, memorandum of understanding. Yes. Is that what I'm hearing you? Uh, yes. And uh, and so um, and I guess the next presentation will deal with monitoring and compliances of 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 this. Right. Is that what we are? My understanding of this. So once we work out the language that would be a requirement for certain projects, then we'll figure out how we implement that. They'll put a system together. And we also want to just have some conversations with some contractors just to make sure there's no unintended consequences here. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, we think we can design a, a unique system for us that will, I think, achieve many of your goals. And we'll see after the first project how, how it works. Okay. All right. That's great. Thank you. Ms. Faircloth? So I have a question. Uh, Mr. Beasley, you very quickly mentioned that you've worked with other municipalities and the county. Can you clarify uh, which municipalities you have partnered with with this program? We have one with the county, but we also have with the city of Opelika, city of South Miami, particularly the CRA, as well as city of Miami Gardens. Uh, currently, we have uh, a process in place working with uh, the city of Doral, um, but we're also having a career center over there, so they're trying to tie both of them. They're giving us free space over there to operate uh, workforce services for their citizens there. So it's kind of a, 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 a double, a, a combined component with them. This is city, the city of Doral? City of Doral. So this is the latest municipality? This, the, this city would be the latest uh, municipality we're working with. Yeah, the city we're Doral is, uh, yeah, we're still working with them because they're combining a career center as well as trying to provide these services. So uh, that one a we're still A career center? Career center, yes, ma'am. Yeah, we uh, uh, work with a number of municipalities that we've actually gotten free space uh, to provide services. We've always made the commitment that I'll put the investment into the community. Uh, we put an investment of the community about uh, $1.4 million of employment training services in Homestead, and we provide services there. We contract with a group called Youth Co-op to provide the services. We don't provide direct services. I'm actually a funder, and that's what we do. We, we initiate and fund uh, components to provide employment training solutions throughout the counties. 
And so this will not cost the city of Homestead one dollar. One dollar. One. It's federally funded. Federally funded. So it won't cost us yeah. anything. Won't cost you anything. And also, uh, Councilwoman, the nice thing about their organization, unlike some others that accept these kind of funds, is that they don't like the one size fits all model, and they're willing to work with each city to to craft a program that works best for each one. So exactly. that was very uh, a pretty well appreciated by the staff because. They're more than well, well, willing to work with us to try to make sure this fits everyone's needs. And my last question, Mayor, just finally, can you touch, I'm always looking out for our residents, but our youth also, can you touch briefly upon the Scholars Program that you referenced earlier? I knew you were going to ask me that. I know you were. <laughs> <laughs> the Scholars Program uh, is, uh, is an initiative that we had kicked off with the City of Miami Gardens. The, former, uh, the current mayor at that time was a city councilman. And he called us in the office and said, hey, you know, I, I really like to help the youth, particularly in this particular neighborhood. They were having some crime issues. And so uh, he thought about a scholars program of having at least 10 youth come in and understand how to work and get um, work readiness um, skills, uh, to learn how to work, but also to be exposed into government. Oftentimes, we, youth may get exposed to just working in other areas. So he felt that was a way of doing it. So we awarded about $100,000. Uh, to the city to operate, and they've actually operated the programs themselves directly, uh, to offer youth, 10 youth, uh, some were um, um, college age, and then there were five college age and then five uh, high school students. And they worked 20 hours a week learning different components of the facets of uh, city government for the city of, uh, of Miami Gardens. And so um, uh, he's now mayor, Mel Gilbert, wants to again re-energize that program that he initiated. And so when we spoke with Mr. Manager, those are some of the initiatives we can look at. And our, our role really is to work with the city to identify where there are key issues. And so it's not a one-size-fits-all that if we can think of ways where we can leverage resources. Our role here is as a, as a funder is to leverage resources to be able to help our youth. And so any way that I can, that's where we, you know, that's where we come in. And one final question. When do you initiate this process to de devise your initiatives that you're going to place in your budget? I, I typically do it at the beginning of, uh, of June. My board approves my budget in on uh, actually in the middle of June, and so our budget has been approved. We may have, you know, I told the Mr. Manager we can maneuver a couple of things. We'll work here, work there, and you know, we work a little magic. You're just trying to see if you have anything left. <laughs> like I said, I work with some man. We'll work here, we'll work there, and come up with something. Yeah, if you have additional requests, what we thought was, we'll take what we can get the first year. We've get, given them some ideas of what we think might be some quick wins so that whoever we bring into the system, it becomes a really good experience for everybody. And what we think is if they're happy exactly. and the department heads are happy and the kids walk away with something that's of value, then it's going to be win-win and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to expand the program. So we've given them some ideas which we think might be easy, quick wins. And then after, but we'll, before we do anything, we'll come back to you. Uh, but we just wanted to make sure you were all comfortable with this, them as an organization and also you hear from Mr. Riley and his group because he's got a, a different approach to this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Maldonado. Yes, a uh, question for the, to the presenter. Um, you had mentioned that you work with uh, the, the county commission and uh, can you may expand a little bit about what program do you have currently and how in reference to uh, um, well, we have several programs with the county. One is a first, a first source component that we have with them, again, a local hiring. Mm -hmm. Then any contracts uh, uh, awarded uh, through, through the county, um, we, our role there is to work with uh, those contractors that are hiring. Um, and that our role there is to refer individuals over to them and to, uh, you know, to initiate the hiring piece. We also have the community workforce program, uh, which is an, an initiative through the uh, Department of Small Business, uh, Small Business Administration. My business administration, and what's the, the last one? The other initiative, community workforce and a job, the, the clear, job clearinghouse. Um, again, it's an MOU with them to, to assist them in looking or identifying uh, job seekers in those areas. So, and, and then we also fund um, something similar to the, um, uh, the the scholars program, but through the mayor's initiative, where we actually placed last year, it was in our budget this year, to place over 600 youth uh, and actually young adults in employment opportunities is through the mayor's initiative. And so our role there, again, identifies some key areas or key areas or, let's say, low-income areas or distressed areas to help the youth get, uh, get re-energized and get re-employed and get reconnected. So those are some of the initiatives that we've kicked off working with the mayor. Mr. Williams. 
At, at one point in time, uh, I think it was my understanding, uh, during the summer, were, is, was it your organization that were helping to employ youth during right. the summer? Right. Um, I have, uh, um, are, are, is your organization still doing something of that nature? Have you all phased it out? And that's similar, uh, you know, Mr. Councilman, that um, uh, during that time I was doing the stimulus piece. Okay. Under, under, under the federal law, we can't use, and that's why we were trying to be creative, we couldn't use, can't use youth dollars for summer only. We had to make them part of a year-round program. So some of the youth that are here in Homestead are part of our year-round program, so they get a summer component. During that time, we initiated an employment, a summer only component, and a number of employers in this community took a, uh, an active role. We've done something similar where we have hire young adults uh, through a summer, well, we don't call it summer, but a young adult initiative. And so we're still doing that initiative. That actually we're doing the recruitment right now, and we've asked youth to, to uh, register online for that. I'm sorry, yes. We've asked youth to register oh, online. We've asked youth to yeah, register online. Right. And actually young adults, we call them youth, but young adults between the ages of 18 to 24 years of age. Okay, okay. Um, okay. okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Riley? Good evening, uh, Council. Uh, my name is Al Hardiman. I'm here representing uh, Mr. Riley here, which I'm familiar, everyone is familiar with Mr. Riley, and uh, I have come to know him for over 25 years, and uh, uh, my particular address is 655 Northwest 50, uh, 48th Street, Miami, Florida, uh, and the reason why I said it like that is because Mr. Riley, his address, uh, his workforce, Gospel Truth 161, 68, I'm sorry. Southwest 4th Street. Southwest 4th Street. Thank you. Um, the reason why I brought that up, and good evening, and thank y'all for being patient. Uh, in fact, what Mr. Beasley is offering is a great thing for Homestead. Make no doubt about it. In fact, uh, Mr. Riley, his workforce corporation uh, has applied will continue to apply to be part of the organization because Mr. Beasley's organization uh, doesn't uh, directly impact the job itself. But he's certainly needed. Uh, certainly Mr. Riley needs to continue to cooperate with Mr. Beasley if we're going to make these things happen. But the reason why uh, I feel so strongly about this because I could go back three years ago, uh, I met the manager, I met the director uh, of procurement, I met Ms. Patty. Uh, and, and I said that because they said with conviction then that these projects were going to be. They said, well, we haven't put it together yet. Uh, we want to have an impact on all the districts. And, and, and that's what I took from that back then, that we should prepare ourselves for when these contracts are let by Homestead. Be prepared. That one job should be given out uh, for sympathy purposes, but based on qualifications. So we had three years to prepare ourselves. Mr. Riley did. Uh, to be qualified for the jobs that, that come out of there. And once these projects are finished, every single district would be able to point to it as history that they were part of it. And every district has different contributions to these projects. But they're all homestead. We are all citizens of Homestead. All of these projects, certain districts contribute certain, certain things to it. In Mr. Riley's district, and we are all adults here. Let's be fair. The, the, say the percentage of getting the engineer from that district 
even though they may be qualified, but they may not win the bid. Or, or the electric company, the infrastructure, sure, I, I don't believe that the rail electric company, who is an excellent company, uh, will be outbid by Mr. Riley district. So you have to put them in the contract because Homestead, the policymakers, must protect the taxpayers' money. That's the bottom line. You've got to get the best for your money. So we are not going to sit here and, and call any favors because there's no favors when you're protecting the taxpayer money. So my company, which is the American Workforce Network, what we emphasize is, is policies, in our policies, we have monitoring and compliance focused on the contractors based off the agreement with the municipality. $25 million is going into the new city hall. Wonderful. That's taxpayer money where you are elected to protect. And they serve in the public servants, your employees, they are there to make sure that that is done to the penny. So what we emphasize, along with the help of, uh, uh, of an entity like Mr. Beasley, is how can we get those that are falling through the crack, but make sure all districts are represented in that development or in that contract. What normally is there in the administration of the general contractor? I, I, my emphasis is not on the city, period, but what the city have agreed to with the general contractor. What we look at is in the administrative portion of percentages with the general contractor that allows for the outreach. It allows for what we would call soft costs where, in fact, uh, the words, if you never see me again, I would like for you to remember, schedule of value. I mean, if I gave you $25 million, I can show you how I spent your $25 million. If I say to you that I'm going to use uh, $5 million for, for concrete, $5 million should be used for concrete. But the half a million that I'm going to use for administration, that's over there. But it's all within the 25 million. Schedule of value will never allow you again to be misrepresented in your district. Because in, inside every contract that you pass here, you are representing every district inside that contract, either through the administrative part, to the, G, to the general contractor, or through the hard cost, meaning that you have someone that can do, do the electrical contract in your district. Maybe you don't, but everyone has someone because that general contractor, one of the things that he agreed to in his general term in his contract is that he has goodwill to the community. Meaning, in, in, in other words, in my soft costs, I can hire an upstart workforce like Mr. Riley. Mr. Riley, I want you, when I need you, I need you to find me a certain labor. Because most contractors, in their particular scope of work, they know the professionals who they need to hire. And they won't put that burden on a Mr. Riley. But laborers, he can find those. Mr. Riley, inside my $25 million that that Homestead, I want this bid from Homestead that I have in here enough to hire you that every head that you have, I will give you $3 an hour per person you place on the job. Now, that's not coming out of the district. That's out of the district. So what would Mr. Riley do to make sure that he can find someone and it's properly done? And we're not talking about uh, paying in cash. We're talking about actually writing it down. He will go and get with Mr. Beasley and finish all of his paperwork with Mr. Beasley, but Mr. Beasley already has a list of all the things he needs to be, to be uh, uh, certified in the workforce. So this will help 
everyone. So no one can say in any district that this body is being unfair with their tax money because not all of us are at the same level. And if once we start looking at the investments that y'all are overseeing, these two guys should be able to work together because y'all can tell them, work, y'all work together. But y'all not doing the same thing anyway. Y'all can make them do work some for the community. Now, every district, 10 years from now, can say what? Man, I helped build that. Because more important than your life is your history. And that is what we are trying to uh, generate here. Okay, let me ask the, let me ask the manager a question. Um, <laughs> what I'm having a hard time. We're talking basically, about basically the long and the short of their proposal is that the city would require the contractor to hire them to to track and monitor how many people uh, they would hire and they would get. And one of their proposals was for every person that they refer, they get three dollars an hour for their services. There was one proposal where they suggested a sixty thousand dollar contract that would be paid by uh, the contractor for each one of these jobs that they do. And so it's a different model. And they've got a bunch of different ways to, uh, to operate, but their, their basic premise is that we as a city should require a contractor to enter into some sort of a contractual relationship with them to, in essence, go through them to hi hire their workers. Okay. Yes. Mr. Let Williams. Let me see if I can uh, help in a moment. The homestead is so very much different in its process. First of all, in its procurement process. Second of all, we don't have single member districts to where we, uh, as I think you're probably accustomed to, single member districts to where things are allocated like that through districting. We run at large for the whole entire city, though we represent certain areas of the city, but there's not a pot of money that uh, I have in my district versus anybody else. It's all, we all share the same resources as it relates to that. The second thing is our procurement process. When these solicitations go out and these people are bid for, let's say, for the city hall, they bid uh, based on what they go back out to get from their subcontractors and their, so those, and so once they submit those bids back to us, they've already kind of cho chosen their subcontractors to do the work and labor and company, so it would be very difficult with your process to try to implement that within our system based on how we are set up as it relates to our procurement process. And so I hear what you're saying, I'm agreement with what you're saying, but I don't know if we are in the, the ideology of what you're stating on how we can put that into our system based, based on uh, how we operate as it relates to our procurement process. So when the bid went out or solicitation for bid, and Jerry, correct me if I'm wrong, or Mr. Manager, correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, when those bids come back in, they've already bid it out for their subcontractors for electrical, whatever, concrete, whatever. Yes. And so they are pretty much cost already, hard cost in that. And yes. it's very defined and very uh, rigid because I've tried in the, in the process to try to uh, put that, what you're saying, into the process and it could not work because of our system. So either we change the system, uh, which will not work for these projects because they're already uh, have been indicated and allocated and contractors have been already um, selected based on the procurement process early on in the stage of the of, of, of the bid. So I, I, I hear you, I understand you, but I don't know if that's going to work within the framework in which we are already establishing. Am I right, George? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I just want to make sure I was if I, if I may, not uh, uh, in that. Councilman, if I may, yeah. and, and, and you are making an a, a, a excellent point in the hard cost, in the soft cost, which is administrative. Normally, when a GC wins the bid from the owner, and y'all are the owner, there normally is capped at 12%. But what, and that is where I look, you know, what, why in your administrative uh, 
payable to the city, or your receivable, is it more than 12%? Uh, well, I can see what it costs. That's why I said schedule of value. Know what he's paying. What, the, what, what is it the GC is paying out? Yeah. If the GC is getting, getting paid a million dollars for, uh, just for the sake of saying, for paint, to paint something, a million, but his actual schedule of value or his actual cost is only 600000 So that's a 40% administrative profit where his agreement says that he's supposed to only get 12%. Yeah, so but what I'm, saying to, what I'm saying to you is that's not, that's not how it works here in Homestead. And that's not no, I'm saying that based, I'm, I'm trying to help you out and it's trying to help you out because okay. you're losing some people up here. I'm trying to help you. Um, you based on the way our system is, you're, what you're saying, we are not structured and the numbers that you're quoting are not to where it is related here in Homestead based on our system. So what I'm saying is, we are, and help me out from from saying anything wrong, Jerry, or Mr. Manager, is that what you're trying to help us to do or get us to do, based on our current system, it doesn't matter who the GC is or the general, when the when the solicitation goes out. They submit those costs. Whatever the cost comes back, that's what it is. It's a, it's a, it's a sealed bid. We don't get to view it. We don't get to make a decision on it until it hits us. And by that time, they've already added the cost in of each project or what it's going to build, uh, a scope of service of what it's going to cost to build the city hall. So what your idea of it is, is a lot different or your ideology is totally different from our system. We won't be able to incorporate that into this system because it, it does not, it's not structured for such. What I think, what you're trying to do is to ensure that persons within the local community uh, are hired that has some of these skills. Uh, that's not going to work in our framework or system. And so I think you're probably going to have to go back to the drawing board and figure out a way that it's going to be able, you're going to have to come up with something new to figure out how it will work in our system on the front end because we can't do anything once it hits us on the back end here at, at this dais. It's up because it's all, it's, it's within our policies. It's out of our hands at that point in time. So we, we can't not do anything as it relates to that. We can't legislate it um, because that's what the, that's what we have uh, our procurement process is, and uh, the and the director uh, or the general director for the area said the procurement process we have is working in place, um, and you're trying to add a component of to ensure that local people get. The, I'm with you. I've been fighting for that, but it but your ideology of of how to, is not going to work it into homestead system, so you're going to have to come up with a different mechanism to incorporate that. So, so I think with that, we should move on. Mr. Yeah, let's, let me interject something here. One of, the, one of the main things that's a major difference, this adds a layer outside of the layer that's already inside. Right. Secondarily, it adds cost to the taxpayer's burden of the construction project, which the other company was federally funded. So it's, to me, it's more of a funding issue uh, as, as it is anything else. So let me just ask a question. Is anyone in favor a direction wise of the second presentation over the first presentation. Is that what you're asking for? Yes. Or are you in favor of the first one or are you in favor of the excuse second one or excuse me, excuse me now uh, uh, like I like I talked to uh the council uh, uh William and uh and some of the rest of them uh, 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 about you know uh my workforce, you know uh okay, you know uh, I understand that uh you know uh, these are the uh, they're already being paid by the federal government, and uh, and uh, you know I'm not getting paid like that. But I'm I'm here here in Homestead, and I'm here in Florida City, and I've been running around here, Mr. Beasley, for about 40 years. It's my hometown. I know you from St. Louis, and we heard you in our community, and 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 I was telling the councilman if I can't get paid, hey. 
I still want to have an opportunity to have people out of home still in Florida City. Too much crime going on, and the people need jobs. The young people, old people, they need jobs. And, uh, and, and a lot of times, you know, I, I tell you, it's just like it is. You know, you know I, I, I respect, you know, all the technology that some organizations have. But for some reason, our neighborhood been left out. And, uh, and I'm hoping to understand me that, that the councilmen here in Homestead, that they recognize that our community been left out and we no longer want to depend on that type of technology to make sure that our people in our community, cause I got, I got, I ain't got it all on stream and all that. I got a stack like that. All kinds of carboners, labels, lake crystals, bot layers and all. Red right in home state of Florida City that want to go to work. And, and I promise you, when that general contractor or whoever called me and say they need this or need that there, I'm going to make sure home growing gives out. I'm going to get nail penny. I want to see people in our community work. So if, if, if there's no money, uh, a councilman say, Go back to the drawing board and came back. I just did. Here's what, here's what we're all trying to do the same thing. That's, I, I think that's clearly the intent of this whole discussion is to try to find a way to get our local people in these either trained for the job or in the job. And I think we're all trying to do the same thing. It's just the, it's the, the process by which we do it. So we've got everybody's information has been talked about. The council has what they need to have in order to give the manager direction to go forward with negotiation, follow-up, bringing with back. one, two, or none. One, two, or none. So, um, and, and, and when you say train, I had a group of young men in here just a while ago. They had to leave. One, two of them was my son. I had one son that worked for Lady Vici and Lady Vici. He's a maintenance supervisor, started right here with God's true workforce. And he hired... He can pull this room up in here with the people that he doesn't work with. Then I have another son, the AC technician. Understand me? And, 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 and all that comes from under the work for We have plenty training. See, this ain't just talk. I'm talking about just real. They just ain't have the opportunity to work. Now I'm asking you, help me put the, our community to work. Where they can stop all this you know, trouble in our community. When they get home in the evening time, they're so tired, they'll go get some rest and go to sleep. Okay, one, two, or none. My one. suggestion, Mayor, Mike, if I right may add one, is that uh, they both uh, have a common goal uh, and a commonality. Um, one is more corporate structured, and one is, you know, more community oriented driven. And um, um, uh, I hear Mr. Riley. I, I hear his 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 plea, and I, I hear his passion and uh, it has not gone unnoticed. Uh, somehow, um, I'm not uh, sure if Mr. Beasley will be able to uh, perhaps entertain a conversation with them to see how they can utilize one another in, in, in their program. And so I don't want to give a vote to say no to one and one. To, I want to perhaps create a hybrid to where they can perhaps have a com get an idea of have a conversation. I'm not sure if they had one. Uh, to have a conversation um, to be able to see if they can merge some of their ideologies together so that we can have one product. And then that way we both, they both come out to some type of, of that. So I'm not sure. I know you need direction. My direction is that my suggestion is for them, for them to go have a conversation and to see if they can work out um, um, something uh, that will be beneficial. And then by next week at the council meeting, if there's nothing, then I think um, we should be able to decide by then. But at least give them opportunity. So I'm not pitting one organization against the other because one is more high tech, which is rewarded for, and then one has the other capacity of the passion and stuff. So I don't want to dismiss that because they're not, they don't have the technical part and they're not federally funded. So I want to try to see if they have an opportunity to talk and perhaps mesh this together. And if they're not, by next council meeting, then we can make a, 
a decision. If I may, one thing that is a little confusing to me is what they proposed to us involves them charging for what they do. Today they made an alternative proposal. But what confuses me is that if Mr. Beasley's group is willing to do the outreach, is willing to have a database, and if he has the big stack of papers that he says he has, they're more than willing to work with them to process them and do their things, but there's no need for a structured agreement with them because they'll be one group of many in the community that have access to people and, 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 and people who, who have talent. And I'm just not sure that you want to put that, that responsibility on Mr. B. Beasley's group to have some sort of a structured agreement. No, I'm not saying have a structured agreement, but at least the, the, the stack that they have could be probably utilizing that database. That's all I'm saying is that allow them to have a perhaps conversation because what, what, I'm, what I'm feeling here tonight from, from the, uh, the, the organization is that uh, they've tried over and over to come to the city to get some type of um, aid and assistance to, for their organization. Now here's the opportunity perhaps we can weave that into that and the, uh, the objective could be achieved. And all I'm saying is to perhaps allow a conversation to take place between the two organizations and to see if they can fit into one. Uh, that, that's all I'm saying to do that. Then whether me vote one yes and no, because I, I don't feel comfortable doing that. Mr. See, see, uh, 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 thank you, Councilman. See, what's going on here today, uh, City Manager and everybody that hears me? We got a problem. And, 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 and I heard Martin Luther King say, we all can go up together, or we all come down together. We got a problem. And that problem in my community, it can get in your community. And, 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 and for some reason, it seems like people just don't care about some certain community. And I'm saying, Mayor, what I'm saying I'm today is, to exception to that, Mr. Rod, Mr. Rod, Rod, listen, if we're crossing the line here, that's everybody's that's trying right. to be civil. Don't, no one up okay, here is preferring, me. no one excuse up here, me, excuse the me. manager is not, no. so. No, no, I'm not talking no, directly to the No, no, but you're, no, you're, no, you're no, being no, specific no. as though we're leaving a particular no, no, community no, behind. No, 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 ma'am. No, okay, no, well, the, no, so I'm sorry about okay. that. No, I I ain't talking about the city manager, don't care nobody, nobody, no, but I see some people. Okay, nobody in this room. Some people, but we got the care, excuse me now. I'm talking about, see, see, what, it's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of killing and stealing and robbing and all that there, because some community have been left out. Ms. Faircloth, I wants to ask and, you a question. Ms. Faircloth. Speak. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Mr. Riley, you're very passionate about ensuring that our local residents are privy to these jobs, as am I and everyone on this council. And South Florida workforce. I think there is one goal, and that is to ensure our residents are hired. However, with one, it doesn't cost us a dime. And with your um, proposal, there's a price associated with that, potentially, potentially. But I, I don't want this community or this board to feel as if the city has not extended an olive branch to you because we have worked with you, the CRA, Mr. Amarado, are you still here? The CRA, you've worked with the CRA for projects. So we've been working in partnership with you. What I like about Career Source and the presentation that I've heard in the meeting that I've had with Mr. Beasley is that yes, although it's commercially um, adept, but there is an outreach component that they are willing to move forward with. and. What else piques my interest is they reach out to a larger constituent group with the scholars program to ensure that our high school students or college ready students have the opportunity to work. I am sure Mr. Beasley would be willing to meet with you to just get some ideas and feedback from you as far as how they can proceed, but I'm not in favor with a partnership or an agreement and I think you clarified that. I'm sure Mr. Beasley would be willing to meet with you, and this board will hold whoever 
is afforded this opportunity accountable because that's what this council is about, accountability, and we're not going to allow anyone to fall through the cracks. So based on both presentations and, and some research I've done and the meeting that I've had with Mr. Bees and the conversation I have with you, I feel comfortable with proceeding with career source to um, move forward with ensuring that our local talent is a first source for hiring. Okay. You, do you have your direction? Do you think you have your direction? Uh, I'm assuming direction. Is there anyone that, that would like? We have, we're on tab three out of 21. Mr. Mayor. Okay, and it's 9.30. Is there a consensus for one, I guess would be my question. Is there a consensus for one? We have to go forward. We have to move forward. Is that your recommendation? I think that, I think that that's the consensus. Thank so you. we have to move forward with this. We, I'm sorry, we just have to go forward. Uh, tab four. Ms. Wallman. Because the property that's being discussed um, happens to be listed with the office that I'm affiliated with at West Century 21. Okay. So, okay. Four. Tab four, Mr. Manager. Dennis. Mr. McCann. Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members. Uh, staff recommends that Mayor and Council consider purchasing two parcels located on the north side of the William F. Dickerson Community Center, 1701 North Chrome Avenue, Homestead, Florida, 33030, for the purpose of accommodating parking for council meetings, special events, and banquet rentals. Currently, the use of the community center has uh, exceeded parking lot capacity. This is a result the users to use their uh, two primary owned properties and the swells around the community center. The listed price is $249,000 for both partials. Question, uh, if, if it's purchased, you have impact, you have park impact fees to purchase it with? Yes, ma'am. If it's purchased with park impact, impact fees, is it a park? Uh, we if we can use the uh, impact fees. The only thing I wanted to let the mayor and vice mayor council know that we would have to do a zoning change okay. for the parking lot. But when I don't, you know, if if we buy it and then ultimately down the road we realize that it's in a higher and better use, uh, sold for something else. If it's a park, it's very hard to revert a park back from, you know, uh, from something back into existence use. So I don't want to. If we're going to buy it and we have the flexibility to move it back in because it's a retail corner on Chrome. I just want to make sure that if we do that, second question would be if we buy it for parking, are we going to have to pave it? Yes, sir. And, and approximately would be probably around $120,000 to convert it into a parking lot. Okay. Vice Mayor? Yeah, I just, my only concern with this is because I don't know what the plan is. I mean, other than just a parking lot, do we have any additional use for that property? Because it seems like if we're going to spend 350 something thousand dollars in park impact fees, is, is that the best use of our park impact fee money? Are there other projects within other parks? Can it go toward the, the potential soccer lights? Could it go, you know, is there other, other purposes for it? Um, is my only question. And have we looked at options to, say, lease properties nearby versus buy to provide the overflow parking? So I'm not opposed to it. It's just that I don't have enough information or have enough plan at this point that I know that I'm comfortable with it. Uh, Vice Mayor, I, I understand your concerns and, and what you're saying. The uh, only thing was when we found out it went up for sale, we did get a lot of complaints from the owner saying that people are parking there. And in, I don't know if Mayor and Council have seen when it does have special events here and our council members, our council meetings, they are parking in that, that uh, extra lots there. Right. Yeah, I mean, I disagree. I've seen them park over there. I, I know there's a parking issue here that we need to try to address. I'm just not convinced yet that spending 250 and or 300 something thousand by the time you get done paving is is necessarily the best. I, I, that's the question. Is that the best use of our park impact fees, or could we use those for other purposes, or is there other solutions to the problem before we get to the purchase part? And I don't know that I have. I'm not 100 percent convinced that that answer is yes. So that's where I'm a little concerned about giving clear direction to say I support it. I'm not opposed to it. I'm not against it at this stage, but I don't know that I, I support it either. Can I get a motion to extend for 30 minutes? Move it. There's a second? Second. Okay. Motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor. 
Yes, sir. I just wanted to answer his question. Uh, if we do do a lease around another parking lot or maybe lease the land, then that will affect our budget. So, you know, we're looking at if we just purchase it and it's a one-time, you know, uh, solution. Mr. Burgess? Thank Is that you. okay? You, you, Mr. Burgess? Thank you. We've got $249,000 for the list price. And you said how much to pave it, Dennis? And the lights and the striping and the concrete. Drainage. And the electricity all year, and it coming off the ad valorem tax roll. Yes, sir. We're, What's the total number? We're, <laughs> we're thinking that by our calculations with drainage and, and asphalt landscaping and lighting, around one hundred and fifty, sixty thousand dollars. So, so one hundred and sixty more, and, and and it's done. Yes, sir. How many nights a year do you think it's necessary? Uh, I would probably say in most of our council meetings are are full, so you're thinking that's 12 times out of the year, plus our events that we have, yard sales, and also for our dinner with Santa every year. So I would probably say around 15 times. Okay. Mayor, I'm going to be voting no. So take that. Anyone, any, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't, you said he what? He just said he's not in, Mr. Uh, Burgess is not in favor of it at this point. In, um, Ms. Uh, Faircloth? Yes, yeah, just one question. What is the anticipated return on our investment for this? Um, to understand your question, you said the return on our investment. Yeah. What are um, you expecting to generate? Well, as you know, we really don't charge for parking, so I wouldn't be making no revenue from it. So the, the thing is, is just accommodate and make the parking, you know, a better situation at the community center as it is now. It's Everybody's parking everywhere. Well, eventually, we are building a city hall. So you can back 12 days out of it um, in, in respect to that. So, I mean, obviously, then if there is a parking problem here, it's, it's significant when it's, when it's here. But the question, you know, I, I just know if you, I just know how hard it is to revert something out of a park use. It, it, it's an act of Congress, and I just would be, you know, if we decided, you know, six six years, five years down the road that, that it's underutilized and we wanted to put it back into higher and better use, would we be able to based on the fact that we bought it with park impact fees? That's really a, a question. And, Mayor, I understand everything that Council is bringing up in front of me. My thing was to make this a discussion to notify you that this went up for sale and we were looking at the concerns that we had in parking. And I do understand everything the council is saying here. But, I mean, it sounds like it's a reasonable deal, but I don't, I don't know if, you know. So uh, consensus from council in any yeah. direction? Yeah, uh, Mayor, let me Would you get a crack at this. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is, um, and your main purpose of it is for, how many, how many banquets do we have out here throughout the year? Do you have any the data that you can. Councilman Williams, and let you know that uh, this banquet hall is used for a lot of different things. Uh, it could depend on who's wet, uh, you know, renting it, but weddings and I, I don't know how many times, but it's full every every uh, week. And does it and does it pack out the parking area up there? At some part, at some parties that we do rent out, yes, and some no. Okay, so this is more of a convenience, perhaps, to, yeah, yeah. And this is the list price, and uh, what uh, what appraisals have been done on it? If, if, do you have any copies of what the... Uh, no, Councilman, more or less, I wanted to bring this to discussion, and I would, of course, then start getting some different uh, appraisals around what the area would spend. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't have a problem with it. I just, just need some more information, Dennis, to to really be have a conscious, you know, to to, to really support it. Um, so, the way it looks now, we're just gonna have to. I don't think you have it. <laughs> I, I think there's more questions than answers. Yeah. All right, so all we were asking for was permission to negotiate. It sounds like we don't have that, so we'll move on. Okay, what, what, Thank I, you. what I'd like to do is uh, move.
eight and nine up for Mr. Jones, who's been standing patiently. Mayor, I have a suggestion for you. And unless you have any major questions, we could throw all these items on the consent agenda. And if anybody has questions on any of those oh. next week, you can just pull them off. I know it's getting late, and we've got negotiations afterwards, which may take some time. Mr. Jones, did you uh, did you have anything to say specific to your two tabs? We're gonna we're gonna try to move this thing forward um, since he's been here all night. Okay. Um, do you guys want to move it to the consent agenda, or you want to talk about it now? Well, I just had one. As far as the whole bulk of it, I mean, tab tab 13. I don't want to go on the consent. I want to have that discussion, so I don't have to pull it at the at the council meeting. But everything else, I'd be okay with. Tab 13. And then tab yeah tab five, which is. Also for discussion. Okay, so everybody's okay with moving everything except five and thirteen. Wait a minute. Yeah, we're working fast now. Yes. Y'all be approving. Th Second. Okay, there's a motion to move everything but wait, five and wait, thirteen. Let me just look at it. Now. I know. Would you I know. Just, just stating where we are. To the to the consent agenda. Yeah, okay. I don't and even if we put it on the consent, we can pull it that night. Yeah. So, yeah. so there's a motion and a second. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Okay, so everything, we'll go back. Mr. Jones, you can go home. Um, Excuse me, Mayor. Yes, I didn't get that first and second for the motion. Um, Vice Mayor and, and Mr. Burgess. So we'll go to tab five. Tab five. Wait, before, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, Miss. Okay, I, wait, wait, wait. I, I don't like. Go ahead. Okay, tab five. Mayor, tab five uh, is uh, being brought forward as uh, at the last uh, council meeting. Um, uh, Councilman Burgess uh, requested um, or asked that uh, we provide some information with respect to uh, puppy mill regulations and more specifically the uh, recent uh, Cutler Bay ordinance that was um, uh, approved uh, dealing with the retail sale of um, puppies and kittens. Um, so uh, it's teed up as a discussion item uh, for the council. Uh, to entertain your thoughts on perhaps moving forward with a similar proposed ordinance as Cutler Bay, which uh, bans the retail sales of uh, puppies and kittens in pet stores. Only. Did the county do something, Mr. Burgess? Uh, yes. They have done, yes. Yes. They yes. The, they were sponsored the, by Commissioner Bell. Right. I, I thought they did. The, the county has a proposed ordinance uh, that uh, is going to second reading, uh, I believe, in September. It's already gone to first reading in committee. And it's a more detailed ordinance than the Cutler Bay ordinance and goes a little bit deeper with respect to um, uh, breeders, not just uh, puppy stores or pet stores that sell puppies. Um, I, I will caveat in... in uh, uh, my partner David Wolpen had mentioned at the last council meeting that um, uh, there was some current litiga pending litigation that uh, was uh, filed uh, uh, against the city of Phoenix. Um, and most recently, there was some litigation that was filed here in South Florida uh, against um, um, I think Delray Beach and the uh, city of Sunrise uh, with regards to their regulations. Um, and a number of cities have uh, have decided to wait to see what the outcome of that litigation is going to be. Um, some cities have proceeded uh, with regards to the proposed ordinance. Um, the way that the Cutler Bay ordinance is drafted, it, it primarily deals with the retail sales at, puppy sto at, sto at pet stores uh, and carves out an exception that uh, if those puppies or kittens are associated with a nonprofit, um, there's an exemption, and I can try to answer any 
questions or details that you Mr. Burgess, did may you want. Thank you, Mayor. This was brought to myself and to another and to Councilwoman uh, Paracloth by uh, Hallandale Beach Commissioner Michelle Lazaro. Um, and, and one thing that, that I'd like to point out is, is that Pinecrest, Palmetto Bay, and a lot of other municipalities are going forward in, in regulating this. And if we're the only people that don't take action, then those people that want to do this type of business are going to all end up down here. And I don't think we want that. Puppy mills, and this isn't to, to knock anybody's business, but they're not a, a great business to have. Uh, or, to, or for our residents to go buy from. There's a lot of dogs that come out of there sick. There's a lot of dogs that come out of there with all, all different types of problems. And I just felt, <clears throat> as we sit here and see the passionate people come up before us time and time again in this community with the stray dogs and the dog, abandoned dogs or whatever you want to call them, that perhaps if we put one more notch on our belt, that we can start to help curb this problem that we have down here in South Dade. And this doesn't, I checked with our, our um, licensing uh, department. We have no stores that are currently in the city of Homestead that do this type of business, so we wouldn't be affecting anybody. We haven't had anybody that she can recall, that she could recall ever in the history of her being here in the city doing this type of business. Uh, the two pet, pet supermarket and, and Petco now currently work with um, uh, uh, different uh, rescues to offer animals which are, are, are not sold. They are given for a fee of, of, of what the vetting fee is and that's all that they ask for so that it's not a, a, a for-profit for them. So I would just say that with our uh, um, ordinance, if we are inclined to go that direction, that we would make sure that we limit the availability of any animals in a pet store would have to make sure be through a, uh, a uh, registered um, uh, private charitable, private charitable private right. animal shelter. Correct. Correct. And that's what I would ask is it uh, for, for the commission up here to be in, in favor of this and we move it forward. And just a warning, uh, we may have some people come down here as they've sh shown up at some of the other council members uh, from the, uh, that sell these type of things and advocate for, for these type of stores. But uh, I think if we hold the line, uh, there, there's no problems. Uh, I think the, um, some of the lawsuit, James, and correct me, come from places that had stores that already sold these type of things that, were, that they were trying to put out of business. And with us not having that, I don't see us really having any chance for litigation to come back to the city. So I'll leave it at that. Anyone else? Yes. Ms. Faircloth. I'd just like to say that I am completely in favor of the proposed ordinance. Commissioner Michelle Lazaro is a classmate of mine in Good Government Initiative Class 3, and I've spoken to her extensively about this ordinance. I think this is a proactive approach to prohibit puppy mills to proliferate in our city. We don't have any now, so we will join several municipalities who are being proactive. Hallandale Beach, you mentioned Pinecrest, Palmetto Bay, Cutler Bay, Aventura. So this, the city of Homestead wouldn't be a first. We would just join other municipalities in being proactive. So I am in support, support of this ordinance, and I would like to see it move forward. Thank you, Councilman Burgess, for bringing it forward. Anyone else? Is there a motion to so that's move it? Uh, direction. This Actually, is the direction. direction. I, su I support it. Everybody's in favor? I support yeah. it. Okay. You have the direction. Tab 13. Isn't this her item? Leaving? So this was this was the question that came up in the last. Um, it, it came up awkwardly at the end of the meeting. Was the was it wasn't a, actually on the agenda. It came up late in the meeting. She was asking for, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the uh, city donation to the masquerade. To the, where would if if there was so chosen to? I think it was a two thousand dollar contribution. Yes. 
where would the money come from if we if we chose to do it? Currently, there's funds in the public relations account, but as you can tell, how I also wrote this down is, if everything comes in as as budgeted and those funds are exhausted, then we would have to take it out of contingency. But right now, there's currently monies available in public relations. How much was it for? Two thousand. Something we've done before for this particular organization? Have we done, have we? Not that, I'm, not that I'm aware of. This is the first time I think they've done this this type of a of a program, a masquerade ball for SOS. No, they, they've had it, yeah, the, they have it several years prior, just a different theme each year. Yeah. But I believe this is the first time we're being asked to right. sponsor it. Vice Mayor? Yeah, I mean, my, my We've had these come before us before, and, and my position has been pretty clear every single time, and that is, you know, once once you start giving a donation to an organization without any set parameters, that you really can't say no to any organization that's equally situated, because they're all good organizations, they're all good causes, they all they all want to do good things, and so once you kind of start doing it, you can't stop, really, and that that's my concern. So that is more of a, um, so I wouldn't be supportive of it only because of that, because you end up starting something you can't stop. So you need to treat everybody fairly. Okay, so the, if the direction is, is not to support the city funding it, does, does, do council members, any council members have any resource available that they might be able yes. to help the SOS program yeah. to the tune of something like $2,000? It's a net same effect, it just it comes from uh, you know, program dollars that we already have to help you know, reinvest in the community. And I know I've already donated myself monies toward this particular event. I don't remember the amount, but but yeah, so and I, I usually uh, donate to the end of each year too. I'll take a look tomorrow more. I don't know what my account. Is. If, if we could all take a look at our individual yeah. budgets and, and man, my forward. account wiped out, man. Okay. I, I we got there. we got one we got one says the city should pay the money. <laughs> yeah. But Ms. Yeah. Fairclough, I just wanted to add. I, I believe I can speak for our council. I don't like to speak for you all the time, but we we all value what SOS does for our city. But it's just a matter of making sure that everyone is on even keel and no one is favored over the other. SOS is a phenomenal nonprofit organization. I'm sure that we, if we each look at our budgets, we can determine how we can support them from that angle as opposed to supporting it from a city-sponsored angle. So I will be supporting this function. We'll all dig in our, in our stuff, and, except Mr. Williams. He's, he tapped out. So the um, direction would be we'll, we'll find monies. We'll find monies. Okay, and so you're going to handle it through your through, through your, our through our individual okay. Uh, okay. processes, okay. and we'll try to accommodate the the 2,000 number as best we can. And one reminder: we're going to really need you for collective bargaining. So just uh, okay. all right. Um, do we have any more business before this committee tonight? No, we don't. Is there a motion to adjourn? Is there a second? All in favor? Aye. All right, let's go. All right, where do you want to go to the meeting, the next meeting? Where to the next meeting?